Good morning, everyone. Let's stand. We're going to sing this morning. Lord God, we pray that you come and you fill this place this morning. Open our hearts and fill us with your love. You have the power, you have the victory, and we claim that this morning.
for the last five years, uh, we've been working as um, volunteers with an organisation called Streetlight. And um, Streetlight is a youth organisation and primarily we um, hang out with teenagers on Thursday nights at Elizabeth um, Shopping Centre when there's late night shopping. And um, the way it got started was that uh, the former pastor of Elizabeth Church of Christ, Ben Rowe, he um, wanted to take the church outside the four walls and he was walking around the community in Playford one day and saw a lot of things happening with young people at the skate park in Elizabeth. So he approached the council, the Playford council, and asked just to put on a free barbecue. And the, the council was like, that's too much red tape. We're not going to do that. So instead he approached the shopping centre and they were like, hey, like we've got nothing to lose. We've got all these young people hanging around here on Thursday nights, families are scared to come because of all the violence and fights and drugs and stealing and, you know, police always there and security always there dealing with these problems and fires being lit, all that kind of stuff. And um, so they were like, if you can engage these kids and, you know, give them something more constructive to do, give them a bit more positive influence, then why not? And five years later, we're still there and we're expanding. Today, I just want to um, tell you a little bit about the young people that we work with. In Genesis 1.26, it says, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflect our nature. And humans have what you would call a reflective identity. In some sense, they find meaning outside of themselves by virtue of what they reflect. If what you're reflecting is violence, that's where your identity is. If what you're reflecting is God, that's where your identity is. And all these young people are going to reflect is what they see. They're like mirrors. So God calls us to identify these young people in who he made them. They are identities in God. They are children of God. They've been made to reflect him. And he loves them just as much as he loves us, as he loves any of us. But unfortunately, these young people grow up being told that they're worthless, being told that they're stupid, being told that they have no hope of a future. And we really want to speak into that. There was one um, afternoon that we were engaging with the young people at the shopping centre. And um, I gave a young person a $50 note and they were like, Oh wow, okay, can I keep this? And I was like, let me just let me just walk with you through something for a second. So I gave him this food dollar note and then I told him to try and crumple it up, try and rip it a little bit, throw it on the ground, stomp all over it, and pick it back up again. And be like, now try and make it new again. And he's like, Well, I can't. I'm like, okay, what's it worth? $50. So it's been destroyed a little bit. It doesn't look new and shiny and good anymore. It's, you know, had things done to it, awful things done to it, but it's still worth the same amount. And he was just blown away, absolutely blown away. And from there, he, I started talking to him about Jesus and he was asking more and more questions. And so we really try not to push it in the face of the young people, but just be there and build relationship with them and connect with them and allow them to open the doors because they know why we're there. And when we first started especially, the biggest question that we got a lot was, wait, you're doing this for free? Like you're volunteering, you're not being paid to do this? Why would you do that? Why are you here? And it really opened up so many doors and they brought their friends and we really started to build a sense of community. And now five years later, we're starting to see young people that have come, journeyed with us <clears throat> through Streetlight and want to come back as volunteers after meeting God and giving their lives to God, which is amazing. So I really want to come back to what does it mean to be an image bearer of God? People are always asking, especially young people, why do we exist? What is our purpose? What makes human life valuable? Where is our worth, dignity, value and life as human beings come from? And God gives us our value. He created us and then he gave us life and then he died for us to give us life again. And so value really comes down to something that's worth it. You're not going to pay for something that you don't feel is worth it. And God feels that every single one of those young people is worth it. And we feel that every single one of those young people are worth it. And so it's our calling and it's my calling especially that we put that worth into them, that we help them to see what God sees in them, what we see in them. 
Because when everyone else tells them they're worthless, someone needs to tell them that they are worth something. They are worth more. And they need to have that reflection that's something that's different to what they're seeing everywhere else. So how do we put this value into our young people? 95% of the time, we listen. That's all we do. We just listen. We ask questions. We care about them. We put that value into them that way. And then once we're building that relationship and showing them that we care when so many other people don't, we show up consistently and we keep to our word when we say we're going to do something for them. We provide a space for their interests where they can feel safe and be influenced positively. We connect with them opportunities to grow and develop. We walk with them and help guide them through difficulties. We aim to inspire, build confidence and discover their potential and change their circumstance. We feed them both physically and emotionally and we care for them and nurture their mental health. And in that 5% that we're actually talking, we're able to speak life into them. But 95% of the time, we're just listening. And now others are starting to see the value of what God's doing through Streetlight. We've had more funding through Playford. It took four years of Streetlight running for Playford Council to come back to us and ask us to be at the skate parks, uh, which is where we wanted to be in the first place. So we've been operating both in Manapara Skate Park and Elizabeth Skate Park, as well as the Elizabeth Shopping Centre. And we're able to partner with Hope Street and Davin Park with the skate parks as well, which has been amazing. And we keep getting more funding from them to do that. Um, and the funding is really great because we're actually able to provide food for them, which is something that we're not able to do as much at the shopping centre because we do have shops that we have to obviously keep happy so that they're, they're happy for us to be in that space. But at the skate park, there's no shops to be in competition with and so we're able to provide so much more. Um, Grants to help recruit and train more volunteers. Uh, we've had a few orientations in the south now. We're looking to expand and we're actually almost, almost there to having a date where we can actually start up Streetlight in the south and no longer at the shopping centre there. We've got a team ready to go um, and we've had at least 20 people from about 15 different churches down south that are ready to go for a team down there. We've been able to do mental health first aid training with our volunteers and also a first aid training with some of the young people as well. Uh, we've been able to do food cooking programs with them that we've run, um, partnering with various organisations and even Woolworths donated thousands of dollars worth of food for the young people to learn how to cook during COVID. Um, and we've just started doing a art program with them as well. <coughs> as well. So um, from November, I've started actually working with Streetlight. I felt the call from God to not just be a volunteer and not get a regular job and um, pull out of the work that I've been doing. And instead, I've become an urban missionary, which means that I'll be working with Streetlight even more and um, raising my own income in order to do that. Um, and so ways that you guys could get involved is um, prayer. Uh, I have prayer emails that I send out. And if you'd like to be on that list, see me after church. Um, you can volunteer, especially in the north and especially at the skate park. Uh, we run from 3.30 p.m. till 5.30 p.m. on Tuesdays at the skate park. And a lot of our volunteers work full time or study and they're not able to um, be there at that time. But again, if you'd like to know more, see me after church. Um, advocacy, getting the word out. Um, it's so important, just telling other people about Streetlight. Have you heard about what they're doing? Get other people involved, um, because the more churches and the more people that we have involved in this, the more reach we can have for these young people. Um, and finally, financial support. Um, it would mean everything to me for people who are also passionate about this ministry um, to partner with me with a monthly commitment to help raise um, our finances. Um, I currently have 5% of my income raised, which is an amazing start, <laughs> but there's still so much more to go. Um, so hopefully on the next slide, 
You'll also see that we've got social media pages that you can go and follow and there's lots of information on there. You can see what we're doing, you can keep updated. Um, if you feel called to get involved somehow, whether that's prayer, whether that's volunteering, whether that's financially, see me after church. I've got some things to give out um, and more than happy to chat to you about if you want to know more about what Street Light's doing as well. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant. For you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble I will call to you, and you will answer me. Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvellous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I'll walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart, and I will fear your name. I'll praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I'll glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. The arrogant are attacking me, O God. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, men without regard for you. But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. May see and be put to shame. Because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Think about God's goodness, signs of his goodness. Annie being present with us this morning. Annie in hospital, uh, but being able to speak to people, listen to people. God's goodness in that space. David, I know you've had some struggles and tests and you have a sign of God's goodness that all's well in your body. The goodness of God. I think of Dom and I walking on Scott's street and the rainbow going over Scott's home. And uh, we praying blessing on that home that had just been sold. Had no idea who'd bought it. And then discovered Scott and Niang had bought it. And they stood there three days before in that home. Sign of God's goodness. And each one of us, as we walk outside that door, God has said to Abraham, he says to you, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. All nations will be blessed through you. But life is a grind. But God is good. Yes? Amen. Life is great. Some people are in that space. But God is good. Life is filled with grief. God is good. Life is a groan, especially as you get older. The groan and the where. And you begin to maybe life is a grumble, perhaps is another one. But James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of change. I want to reflect briefly into the goodness of God in Scripture in James chapter 1, very briefly. And in Psalms 23, take those scriptures with you this week. Reflect on them. See God's goodness. Then we're going to dwell in Psalm 86, the Psalm of God's goodness. Understanding God's goodness. We need to understand that God's good design in difficulty, counted all joy, various trials, 
through the trial, steadfastness, maturity, growing. You need to understand how much God's goodness releases wisdom. It says God is generous. God is gracious. God is great. Ask for wisdom and you release it. We need an undivided loyalty in response to God's goodness. We can be wavering like the sea, tossed to and fro, but God calls us to fix and focus on his goodness because life is all about his goodness. We need an understanding of God's goodness when trials occur, that God is good. He doesn't cause the temptation. He allows the trials. Why? Because he has a design in all of that. And we need to understand how much we need to learn from God's goodness today and every day and simply obey him. Be refreshed by his presence. Jesus said, John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. When we come to Jesus, we experience the goodness of God, the good news of the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, the grace that pours in and cleanses us of everything. Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Reflect on that psalm. You may have memorized it. Take it to heart this week. The Lord is my shepherd. If you're struggling with temptation or trial, just say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. His goodness will nourish your soul. His goodness leads us in his non-anxious presence. Not only does he provide the green pastures, but the still waters and restores our soul. His goodness shows us the path of right. You lead me in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. His goodness sustains me in the darkest of times. His rod, his staff, his presence. His goodness releases the anointing of that presence. And his joy, God is here. We're in his presence now. And his goodness overflows with abundant fruit. Not only are we anointed, but our cups overflow. Rivers of living water flow. Why? Because God is good. And only because God is good. Not what we do for him but what he's doing in our midst. And that goodness never ends. Andrew's farm will disappear. Devon Park will disappear. Adelaide will disappear. This little church will disappear. God's goodness doesn't disappear and doesn't change. Psalm 31. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. In the sight of the children of mankind, in the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter, in the strife of tongues. God is good. Good and upright, Psalm 25, verse 8 and 9, is the Lord. Good and upright. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right. Psalm 27 13 to 14, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in his goodness. I say to the Lord, you are, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Psalm 16, verse 2. Psalm 118, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Teach me your law. Moses some people identify with Caleb, who took the mountain. Others may be Gideon, who asked for a sign. I, I like Moses, uh, feeling inadequate, I can't do it. But he prayed this big prayer. Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, 
the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God reveals his goodness in grace, giving to us what we don't deserve. In love that is unshakable and unstoppable. And in his faithfulness, he can do it, even though it seems impossible. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Exodus 34, 6. So we pray, show me a sign of your goodness. Open my eyes to see your goodness. This Psalm 86 is a prayer where we, in prayer, we experience God's goodness. If we could just get that, that prayer is not something on the side, but it's the goodness of God, His grace, His love, His holiness, His faithfulness, right here and now. And prayer is God at work in and through us. And this is David facing all kinds of stuff. Uh, he describes God as Yahweh in this prayer, but he also describes him as Adonai five times. Master, I'm your servant. Remember one day I was, um, I'd lost my keys. You ever lost your keys to your car? I was searching around and my daughter was there and I was a bit stressed. Do you ever get a bit stressed when you lose something like that? Where did I put them? And she said, Daddy, why don't you pray? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So we're praying. As we're praying, I put my hand in my bag. And as we're praying, I feel my keys, sign of God's goodness. I open my eyes and say, hey, I found them. She said, Daddy, I told you so. You should have prayed in the first place. In prayer, Psalm 86, we declare our need of God. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the starting point. Total helplessness. I can't do it. I'm not asking you, God, to add to what I'm doing for you. I just can't do it. I'm helpless. I'm in need of you. And then we can pray, our Father in heaven, all the goodness of eternity is then available to you. Draw near to God. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. And he's David. He's a murderer. He's committed adultery. He's made many mistakes. He's had a bad family life. He's got it all rubbish in his life. But I'm faithful to you. Or I'm godly, he even says. What is he saying? He says, I'm drawing close to you, Lord, because I trust in you. No trust in himself. In the midst of this uh, issue that he's facing, he's trusting in God. And in that, he's depending, 86 verse 3, on God's grace. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. We believe this, we put it on our mouth, but often we skip aside, we start trusting something else. We've got to come back. Again, driving with one of my daughters. And she said, came back from school. I'm not sure what they were teaching her at that Tyndale school. They said, did you know that? That Jesus takes our righteousness away. Oh, wow. A four-year-old. I said, what do you mean by that? Our righteousness is filthy rags. That's the story here. Who's going to boast before God? Except in the grace of God. Grace is God gives us a gift that comes from Him. That is goodness. The power of God and the Spirit of God. Breaking everything east from the west. Gone. Darkness gone and light come. Presence of Jesus here and now. What does that cause in our heart? And We often miss it. We're, yeah, I believe. I'm joyful. I'm joyful. But we're missing the goodness of His presence. The light is in God's presence. Gladden the soul of your servant. For you, to you, O oh Lord, do I lift up my soul. That life is an expression of joy. I think, Scott, it was in your home, you can correct me on this, 
we looked at that passage, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And I ask you, what does that mean? He said, that's worship. That's worship. Because that's the presence of God. No room for anyone else's glory in God's presence. So just reminding you, we step in prayer into the goodness of God. We declare our need for God. We draw near to God. We depend on the grace of God. And we delight in the presence of God. We spend a lifetime in that place. We trust in the goodness of God. For you, O oh Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon your name, calling upon his name for his blessing. You are blessed. Going out and calling on his name for his blessing in those dark places and among where that violence is happening, trusting God for his goodness to make a difference in those situations. God's goodness overcomes our own insecurity because God is faithful he can be trusted overcomes our own insecurities God's goodness overcomes our own sense of inadequacy and inability God's goodness overcomes the things that intimidate us only to God's goodness when it's to do with his grace when it's to do with his unshakable love, when it's to do with his faithfulness, his holiness, that he's able to do what he can do. God created all things, it's good. Got messed up by man's wrong, but God is now reconciling it, and he deals with the stuff that's gone wrong in our lives. It's a journey. As, Gary, as Gavin said to me earlier, it's one step at a time uh, in Jesus. We can turn to God who is good. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. If you don't think or feel that God is hearing or you haven't heard him, just turn to him and just say, Lord, listen to me. I'm turning to you. Show me your goodness. Give me a sign today. We can find God's goodness in the troubles. In the day of my trouble, I called upon you. You answered me. Verse 7. God's goodness is incomparable among the gods. There's none like you. Lord, no, no, no deeds can be compared with yours. Verse 8. In goodness, God reveals his glory. And his glory is about his presence everywhere in all creation. Psalm 86 verse 9, all nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. We saw the nations today. We live in a nation today. Here's a prophetic word for us, that Lindsay and I and all of us here living, that the nations will come and glorify his name. That's revival. Revival comes through the goodness of God. That's awakening to the Spirit of God poured out on all flesh. God's goodness is great, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. And that James passage, you know, in the midst of the trial, count it joy. And if you lack wisdom, that, that God is able to do it. He's great. He's gracious. He's generous. Finding then God's goodness in prayer. Teach me your way, O Lord that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Have you ever been in a situation I have where you asked, were asked to do what you did not want to do? Have you ever been in a situation like that? Have you ever been in a situation where you felt inadequate to do what you were asked to do? Or have you been in a situation where you felt intimidated by what you were asked? to do is a good prayer I prayed this prayer in the early 90s Anne and I had lived in India uh, involved in evangelism in, in mission for many years great to have our friend Gary Hawke here who lived in Pakistan
for many years, being a blessing there with Roseanne, who's written some very good books. Sign of God's goodness, just having you with us this morning. Gary, great to have you here. But we, we came back from India after about 10 years, and we didn't know where to stay. My sister was here in Adelaide, and this is in 1989. And the OM leaders said, uh, go to Adelaide. Well, I, I like that. My sister's there, so we went to Adelaide. We had nowhere to stay. So we stayed with my brother for a little bit. But then the Dulos, the ship, this big ship, came to Adelaide. It was in May, I think, or April. And uh, the ship came, so we stayed on board the ship. But we had nowhere to stay after the ship left. And while the ship was here, 300 people, 14 nations, the people of Adelaide visiting, and being blessed by the presence of this gospel ship that has a million visitors every year. And we were blessed by being there. Then... Uh, a little church, an Ellsworth Church of Christ, had a manse, and they invited us to stay in their manse. So we did. And then uh, 10 o'clock one night, some young guys from the university came and said, knocked on the door and said, what's the next step? Well, what do you mean? Well, you, but you're staying. So now what's the next step? And so we started these prayer meetings all around the city and these little study groups once a month studying about, about God's heart for the nations. And I enjoyed it. We saw young people alive. There's a move of God. It wasn't about us. It was about God's goodness at that time. And then the ship was in a place called Zambawanga. There's a gospel event. 30 people behind the stage praying. My friend was preaching. A man opened the door. He threw a grenade in. One exploded and injured 35 people. The other didn't explode. It was designed to kill. One exploded, it killed two of our sisters. They brought the ship down to Australia. They invited Anne and I to go and minister to the people, be there on board. We went across. They ministered to us, the goodness of God, the grace of God in the midst of suffering and loss. And then the leader of the ship came to our cabin and said, Mike and Anne, and he'd said this several times before, since 89, I'm inviting you to come and join us. I said, no way. I'm very happy. I, I don't want to be asked to do what I don't want to do. I, I feel inadequate to do what you're asking me to do. And I feel quite intimidated by that even thought, being on this little ship and getting seasick and all that stuff. And then my wife, who had told me no in certain terms many times, we will never go to the ship Dulos, sitting there next to me in front of this leader, having a cup of coffee in this little cabin, said, yes, I think God wants us to come to this ship. Oh, what would you do? Well, she was patient and waited for the sign of God's goodness to come to me. Sit, frustrated, of course, but six months later, I took a group of men and I prayed this prayer. We went up to Mount Corfit. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I fear your name. Finding God's goodness then through praise, I began to praise Jesus. I give thanks to you, O God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. I began to understand, even on that day, and I've discovered this throughout my life, that as you experience the goodness of God and you say, teach me your way, you want to learn something. You want to walk in his truth. It's obedience growth will happen. But we have to step into it. Even when it means stepping into something you don't want to do, you feel inadequate to do, and you feel intimidated to do. But then you have to be generous with your soul and say, Lord, undivided heart, I give you everything. Not just the money, that's easy. Finding the money for buildings, that's not a big issue. For ships, that's the small issue. The big issue is the people, our own hearts. What are we willing to give fully to him? in response to his goodness. How, where do you start with that? Start thanking him for his goodness. You face a problem, start thanking him for his goodness. What does that do? It reorientates you to the fact that God is good. God is great. God does have grace. God is able to do it. Our identity is found in his goodness. For great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered my soul from the depth of soul. Our identity is in the love of God, the goodness of God. 
our joy is not in what we do for him or what, what we make of things and all our experience. Our joy is in him, his relationship with God. But he says this in verse 14, O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life and they do not set you before them. We can do a lot of things in the name of Jesus, in the name of the church, in the name of what we've done, discipleship, even church planting, even beautiful feet. But if we don't set God before us, it's a religious effort. It's going to be blown away. It's meaningless. What can block or hinder our experience of God's goodness? Firstly, idolatry. Trusting something or someone else to help rather than God. Substituting worship for God for praise of something else. Idolatry. Indifference, not the good indifference that lets go and trust God, but the indifference that is, that is just not aware of the joy. And it fails to be grateful because it's self-reliant, shifting the glory to ourselves. I did this, I did that. And that means we become insolent, arrogant, and proud. And we take control of the agenda for our own selfish interests. I've seen it amongst leaders around the world. I've seen it in my own life. What does God call us to do? To dwell in the goodness of God. But you, O oh Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in the steadfast love and faithfulness. You see, on one side, we have failure. On the other side, we have frustration. But God is good and faithful. Stay close this week, next week, every day to the Good Shepherd. Ask him to bless. He has already blessed, but keep asking him to bless. Find strength in his goodness as you take one step of trust at a time. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servants and save the son of your maidservants. Turn to me. Bless me with your grace. Bless me with your strength. And then you pray. Show me a sign of your goodness that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you Lord, have helped and comforted me. So I'm there in Mount Crawford with a small group of friends. We're just there, Lord, teach me your way. Give me an undivided heart. It's a moment of surrender. A and then I will praise you. A moment of worship. A and I go away asking this, Lord, give me a sign of your goodness. So I go down to Burnside and there's a guy called Ted Lang and I was to speak at his church and he opened the Bible. What does he open up? Psalm 86, verse 11, teach me your way. I go across to Perth with a friend, Richard Beaumont. We have a little meeting. Uh, it's a little charismatic Bible study. This lady said, I've got a word for you. Well, I sort of stepped back a little bit, okay. But then I got settled and said, what is it? God said he's going to teach you his way as you walk in his truth. They had no idea what I just experienced. The following week, I get a phone call from the director of OM in Australia. He said, did you see the facts? What facts? The facts from our international director. Oh, no, I don't have a fax machine. How could I get the facts? He said, I'll send this to you. I said, he sent, and he read it to us. And he said, Mike and Ann, it's the same day we were praying. I'm praying for you today. And I believe God wants you to go onto that ship. No, I took all of that as signs of God's goodness. Here am I, a truck driver from India. That's what I used to do. I drove the truck on the team. We fly to Malaysia. By the way, um, Ray, just as an encouragement, we also trust in God. And uh, on a Monday, uh, and uh, same day, Anne and I, not telling each other, both had a figure of $4,000 in our life, heart. We need that for the airfare. On the Wednesday, a check turned up from someone who'd never given to us, saying, we feel you need this, $4,000. We went to Malaysia. The leader of the work there in Malaysia said, hey, 
I hear you're going to become the director of the ship. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> the deal was that we're just joining the team. No, no, no. You're going to become the director of the ship. Turned up on the ship. Two months later, I become the director of the ship. How does that happen? Nothing in me. Only the goodness of God. Saturday we walked. I happened and walked with pastors at Pora and Glenis. Beautiful time. Just ordinary people watching where is God's goodness at work. There's all this stuff that needs to be changed. I walked with two, two pastors. Um, Pastor Bida from the Bhutanese Nepali Church and Pastor David from the uh, Burundian Church. He was our host. Uh, he's one in that meeting that we had there. He said, don't just think outside the window and experience his goodness in the building. Step outside in that violent situation and be his goodness. <coughs> Bring the aroma of Christ. That's street light. In inadequate, may feel intimidated. But God is able as you step into that. Uh, so, yesterday, uh, Dom and David were leading us, and the other David were leading us. I walked with these two pastors, and I asked Pastor Bida, what did you sense? He said, Mike, the word green is coming to me, green. And the word new is coming to me, very simple, just new, it's just the impression of the heart, because God is with us. And then a uh, little talk with Gavin, he's saying, yeah, God is already at work here. God's people are here. God is at work here. And then Pastor David said, I see beauty. The city is being beautified. But as Gavin told me, it comes one step at a time as the river flows as you step out into his goodness. And then we come in and Pastor Zippor is going to pray at the end. And she shared this. You know, this is to me a sign. Here's Pastor David who's just got this word green. What does that mean? It's got that word. Pastor Zippor gets up and Paul was there. And you walked with Gavin. And, uh, and you had a great walk. Yeah. And, and she said, I've got, I had a dream about green. So, and what was that about? That's about God's life, God's abundance, God's restoring these northern plains. Amen. It's a dream that Annie had many years ago of God pouring out his spirit. So if you're having a tough time, if life is a grind, if you're groaning because of the stuff that seems to be going wrong, take heart. God is good and he's with you. My story is no different to your story. And all God asks us to do is recenter into his story, his goodness. Receive his blessing. See those people and reflect God's goodness to them, the aroma of Christ. But see, see everyone as God sees them, created in his image, valued and loved, that they must turn to Jesus to know the fullness of that goodness. Amen? And thank you. Good Stand and sing our last song for this morning. <laughs>
it has been paid for Jesus' 